Hello, this is John Miller, the creator of this podcast. Now, the rest of Everest is probably the most in-depth look at just what it takes to climb the world's highest peak. But keep in mind that it is a series. And if you're checking out the podcast for the first time, do yourself a favor and go back to episode zero and watch everything in order. That's really the right way to enjoy it. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, John Miller here. Just a couple of notes before we start this week's episode. It's a long episode, so I'm going to try to make this brief. I am ready to give away another t-shirt. Uh, as you may remember, I was doing a t-shirt giveaway, trying to get up to 175 reviews in the US iTunes podcast directory. I have reached 176, and I had chosen a number before the contest began. The number ended up being 164, and that actually ends up, by my recollection, being a review written by Michigan Bob. Now, Michigan Bob, that's the only name I have for you, so if you would do me a favor and uh, send me an email, tell me exactly who you are and uh, your address. I have an uh, embroidered t-shirt sitting right here next to me, all ready to mail to you. I'll get that right out. And I'm going to keep the uh, contest going. I'm going to try to get up to 200 reviews in the U.S. iTunes podcast directory. So uh, anyone between 176 and 200 will be uh, a potential winner. I've already chosen the number, so go ahead and uh, write, a, write a review. This time, since I'm reaching 200 reviews, I'm going to be giving away two t-shirts. So uh, good luck to all of you, and thanks to everyone who's been writing reviews. Those are really, really important to me, and they really help the show out. The other uh, bit of information is we are almost ready to announce all the details for the uh, Rest of Everest Tips from the Top Floor Trek to Everest Base Camp next year, 2009. We're going to be uh, releasing all that information initially to only the people who signed up for the email uh, list on the website everestrek2009.com. So if you haven't signed up for the email list, please go to everestrek2009.com and sign up. Uh, registration is going, to be come, is going to be first come, first serve. We have far too many people interested in the trek to take everyone along with us. So if you really are interested in potentially going on this trek, uh, please sign up because you really are going to want to be one of the first person to register once registration does open. Uh, all the information about the cost, the dates, those, that's all been worked out. Uh, everything's set, so we just have to uh, give everyone the, you know, the scoop. So it'll just be in the next few days we'll be uh, releasing all that information. So please sign up for that uh, email list and uh, look forward to seeing who ends up registering. It's gonna be a, a really great trip. It's gonna be a phenomenal workshop. Uh, it's really exciting. So I think that's all the information I have. So now let's uh, carry on with this week's episode. Here we go. This is the Rest of Everest video podcast, an almost unabridged expedition experience. Episode 93, the end of the Tibet 2007 trek. Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Rest of Everest. I'm John Miller. Joined for the last time for this trek with Scott Jacobs out in California. How you doing, Scott? I'm doing well, John. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. As I mentioned the last episode a couple weeks ago, it's a sad one. This is the last episode from the 2007 Trek. Um, yeah, Scott and I were just talking before I started recording here, and, and not too shabby, pulled uh, 10 and a half months of episodes out of a 19-day round-trip trek <laughs> to Tibet. <laughs> so I guess I, I, do, I do have a penchant for, uh, for filming quite a bit of everything, but uh, yeah, wow, 19... Um, I think I did no. I think I did 17 hours of footage for this for this uh, trek in uh, 19 days. That included, you know, it's Denver, Colorado to Denver, Colorado, and yeah, wow, we really <laughs> really milked it. <laughs> pretty pretty impressive. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's taken a couple of weeks for Scott and I to find a time that we could both <laughs> meet and record, and so we're finally getting out this last episode. Of course. This is not the last episode of the podcast. The podcast will continue. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long of a break I'm going to take. I said I was only going to take a short break last year. Ended up taking a three-month break because <laughs> my uh, ruptured disc in my back. I had to have emergency surgery and all kinds of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully planning on that not happening this time. <laughs> Yeah, you're holding your breath. <laughs> I can hear it, Scott. But uh, yeah, we will be returning soon with uh, Brian Ostrike and hopefully Justin Hewitt to go over their uh, still photos and uh, footage from their their uh, still camera 
posting little videos from their point and shoot camera on their successful summit of Everest. And then once all of that is through, we will be rejoining Ben, Ben Clark, and we are going to go through his Annapurna 4 expedition where uh, he and his buddies went out to the Himalayas this spring and they attempted to ski down Annapurna 4 out in the... Uh, western part of nepal so pretty interesting stuff get back to the mountaineering roots of this podcast that'll be exciting and well you know all that's in the future right now the present is episode 93 the last episode of 2007 trek so what do you say scott let's hit it So as you might remember, last week or the last episode wasn't last week, two weeks ago, we were at Budna Stupa, and we were with this really great cab driver who turned into a tour guide for us, and he took us into some places that I quite honestly didn't know existed uh, when I was here in 2003. Uh, we did not really venture outside of the stupa, and so he kind of took us down this alleyway and then across the road and whatnot, and then we came to this. It's a monastery, and you can hear that the uh, the stupa is far, pretty far away from us at this point. Probably just several hundred yards, but at the same time, it's, it's a completely different world here. Away from the busy streets, basically the the tourist area, we didn't. I don't remember running into many other tourists. And when I say many other, I mean probably like two or three. And uh, remember, we're in the Tibetan quarter or a very heavily Tibetan. Tibetan influence um, in, in Kathmandu. You can really see the Tibetan influence here in the architecture and the ornamentation. And this was so cool because there were monks inside and they were in prayer and they were playing all these instruments and it was just the most otherworldly sound coming out of this Truly. temple here. I love all the potted flowers. And this is loud. The noise is deep and it's resonant. You can feel it on your body even coming out of the windows. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. I mean, it was making the hair in the back of my neck stand up. I was like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> so, uh, quite honestly, I, I didn't hear any of this when we were in Tibet. is amazing the difference in size of the people out here <laughs> everyone's around five feet tall you can see all the monks sandals monk shoes monk sandals I remember we were apprehensive, not apprehensive, but um, respectful or respectfully apprehensive about entering. Um, but here we are, invited in true Tibetan style, um, invited into prayer. Pretty unique. I, you know, I really do remember being a little bit apprehensive of walking in here, but it's, you know, it's actually kind of funny that at this point we're still feeling apprehensive because there was nothing that we experienced over the past three weeks to lead us to be apprehensive about. You know, coming in and watching and filming. I think perhaps it's um, you know this is this is religion, this is faith and, and you know devout Buddhism, and so you know there's something about being a spectator to it that seems maybe a little inappropriate. Um, but you come to realize it's truly not. Yeah. <laughs> you truly get to experience it as as a, a spectator or, or someone from the outside. What I don't have enough experience, and you know, quite honestly, I hope to gain the experience in the coming years and, and decades, is the difference between, you know, again, we're in Nepal here. We are not in Tibet any longer, and what kind of differences you would you would find uh, in in you know uh, when when they're praying in Tibet and when they're praying in Nepal, if there's any differences in in ceremonies or in what what is said, obviously. In one of the temples around Budnath, you did see the picture of the Dalai Lama, which that is that's you know very easily the probably one of the biggest things that's different. 
but you know I just you know it'd be interesting to figure out just how, how everything is 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 different and what what changes between uh, being in Nepal and being able to do you know be the freedom to do whatever you you want or being in Tibet in Tibet where everything's uh, restricted. In the front there, you can see all of these golden statues. I remember standing at the entrance. We had taken our shoes off and found a spot um, by the entrance, by the cloth that we just walked in. And if you could feel the vibrations on the outside, it was just truly an experience on the inside of the, the building here. I also love that you can hear the, the birds chirping in the background as well. This was all open and it really was beautiful here. I, I really, I, I, I can't wait to go back. It just really beautiful place all, and everything was flowering. It was uh, mid-April or near the end of April at this point and it was just a, a really gorgeous time of year. These, these big horns here, these you could really feel. You can see the the Buddha statues in the the front there. <laughs> I like I like that shot a lot of you, Scott, because it, it pretty much you know shows kind of what it was like to be in there. You're sort of like, wow. <laughs> sort of looking around, <laughs> wow. You, you, one of the things I remember about Tibet and you know, this ministry was just, it's so ornate. There's so much going on around you visually and, and especially in this scene, you know, the shot, you know, audibly too, there's just so much happening. <laughs> Everywhere you look, it's just ornate. And there's so many layers to it. Exactly. As well, you know. Not, not only do you have... Well, the the ornateness of of the decorations, um, in terms of a lot of detail, you have all the different colors, and then on top of that, you have what everything signifies, and, and you know, it's meaning. just there's oh, oh everything has meaning, and it's not just pretty, it has meaning, real meaning, and oh, it's just it kind of it kind of makes your brain hurt a little bit. Notice we uh, entered and, and completed a clockwise Cora, mm -hmm. as, as always. The color there on those flowers actually were so intense, uh, the camera really couldn't handle it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> when I look at it with my uh, all my video scopes and everything, it's off the charts. It's just incredible. So what, what we're seeing here is the uh, our driver. He brought us into this it was actually a gallery and these are the uh, Tonka paintings that we've referenced several times and you know these are the artists actually creating them and this really was very cool to see 
because we'd admired the Tonka paintings uh, for, for several weeks, and to actually see how they're done and that it's all done by hand. These are not mass produced in terms of they're not printed, they are all hand painted. And you know, we just talked about detail, colors, and you know, levels of meeting and everything. I mean, that's what you're looking at here. Everything here is extremely ornate, extremely fine detail. To where they're you know, in some places they're painting with like one hair, uh, not not a paintbrush, but it's it's like one hair just to get the fine detail. It really is really is amazing. I remember speaking with um, our taxi driver guide, and um, you know these folks are all apprentice, um, and they're learning the, the the craft, they're learning the trade, and producing these commercially. Um, and he at one time was a Danka painter and uh, said he enjoyed it very much, um, but didn't have the aptitude to become a master, and he really wanted to become a master at Tonka Painter, um, and left to um, mm. drive, drive a taxi, so he left to do other things, but he explained that everyone has a part, and so many people are painting the one Tonka, and you know, it'll go through stages, um, and take you know, anywhere from, a week to several weeks to, to complete. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. These All of these people are not painting their own Tonka. They're simply painting their part of that particular Tonka. So yeah, like there's different uh, stations, so to speak, that they go through and they all have a different area that they, and different, different talent, really. But remember, they will cycle through each area um, to become a master, <laughs> and a master um, would be able to paint an entire tonka on their own, and that's part of the apprenticeship is to learn each station or learn each area of the tonka. And it really gave me a, a great appreciation for the different skill levels because, you know, you'll see in a, in a few minutes we go down to the gallery where we both buy uh, some some tonkas, and you can you can definitely once once you really get an understanding of it and you you see these you really get to get an eye for the different quality levels of them where um, obviously the ones that are done by the masters are more expensive than the ones done by the the newer apprentices but you can really see a difference in quality and you can see why the price differences can be so vast and it's kind of hard to explain now. Um, I think just the the ones that are done by the newer apprentices, everything seems more like all of the lines are thicker, whereas the ones done by the the, the high masters are the, the the level detail is so intricate. And you know, even though you can appreciate everyone everyone's work, when you're going to buy them, you really you you, you kind of lean towards the ones done by the masters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like this one's cool, but this one's really cool. <laughs> and you can definitely see how in the in the gallery that we visited that you know the really expensive ones are they're they're an investment. They really are. In the the left of this image here, you can see the the Tibetan the Wheel of Life. What, do you remember what you bought, Scott? Didn't you buy a, a Wheel of Life? I bought the Wheel of Life. Yeah. Here's the gallery, and look at this stuff. It's just... It's incredible. <laughs> oh, no, like I said, I would like it, but it's too... I can't, I can't afford it. <laughs> yeah, here in the audio there, he's trying to sell you the most expensive one. <laughs> you're like, you're like, I, I, I totally see what you're saying, but I just can't afford it. <laughs> You know, I have read and learned that, um, you know, in the United States, <laughs> you can just bully your way. It's like, no, nah, dude, I'm not going to pay that. But, uh, you know, in, in Nepal especially, you just need to be polite and um, certainly bargain to where the merchant is not losing face. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a polite, it's a polite bargaining. I tried my hand at it. I'm curious, do you think that our driver, do you think he got... Uh a cut of the sales that were made there? Do you think? I, yeah, I think about that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure it, it, it's better for him. You know, we, we obviously tipped him, and it's better for him if we have a good experience. But I'm wondering if 
I'm wondering if he's paid to bring these folks in. I wouldn't, to bring, to bring us in, um, I wouldn't be surprised. Then I wouldn't be upset at all. That was a great experience. Oh, not absolutely. He was, he was fantastic. I bought a really nice uh, Mandela, and I haven't, it's still, it's still all rolled up in its, the shipping tube, uh, because I haven't uh, decided exactly how I'm so going to frame it yet. I'll do justice by it. Last night in Kathmandu, and it's raining. It's really raining. Actually, it sounds like it might be starting to let up. <laughs> A little bit of lightning. Um, <clears throat> we uh, showed you the room that we've got, or the room that I've got. Um, Scott's got the room next door, but one of the things that we really discovered was that we have the entire floor of the hotel. I'll show you. And for those of you interested in the workshop trek coming up, I will have more information about it soon, but we're renting this entire space. Really, really amazing space. What a, what a great thing to you. I just remember <laughs> sitting on this balcony and listening to this rain. Um, the, the, the porch, the balcony, pretty fantastic. Overlooking Tamal. Ah, look at that. Now I'm getting nostalgic. Sort of veranda up here. I remember the hotel owner, or the, the manager, excuse me, being apologetic. You know, oh, you're <laughs> you're not, you're not on the ground floor. We were like, oh, let us have it. It's great. <laughs> so it's just been us, and you can tell it's truly raining. <laughs> when I look at this footage, I remember two things. One, that circular staircase, I was sitting on it on my satellite phone talking to my mother, who had been visiting my brother and my twin brother in California, and she said, are you sitting down? I said, yes. She said, I'm going to be staying in California for a while because I went for a hike today, fell, and broke both my ankles. <laughs> oh, no. I remember <laughs> she had that. She emergency surgery. <laughs> She's fine now. But <laughs> what you got? All sorts of stuff. Some for me, some as gifts. You know, little things for yourselves. Kind of like this guy. <laughs> I have uh, some co workers and some friends. Just little things. I think the novelty of having something from my travels, at least it's novel to me, they might not care, but I think it would be fun to get little beads from uh, Mount Everest. Mount Everest, Mount Everest. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> Yakbone. Oh, were those oh, things from Yakbone? Yak and you can tell it's. it's were they from the tea house? Bone, so. uh, most were from Everest. Or Yeah. Many yeah. um, yeah. were from the streets of Tamil. Mm -hmm. Either way, it's from Tibet. Both were from me. Either way, I'm happy <laughs> with it. Yeah, you can tell they've been carved. And some prayer flags that were draped around my neck at uh, Tongla Pass? No, not Tongla. In the first pass, excuse me. Yeah. I forget the name of the pass. Actually, John, it was uh, but they Tongla draped Pass. Around your neck, and there are five uh, prayer flags. And then, of course, say how much. Ten, ten, ten. But it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, let's see. Some uh, Tibetan turquoise and silver for my mother. He was uh, very excited. He said, oh, great gift. Yeah, great where'd, gift you for her. where'd you get that from? This was uh, Tibet. The, the Barkor. Barkor. Barkor, Barkor uh, Market. And, uh, right outside the Jokong. And, uh, I guess my commercial <laughs> Kora. <laughs> yeah. Your consumer Kora. My consumer Kora. <clears throat> oh, this was a free gift. A Tibetan style hat. And he said, oh, good for you, good for you, good for you. Not so good for me. So, I have an idea where it's. Oh, anyway, they got this at the bar court. And uh, he said, Very good gift for girl. Very good gift for girl. And I said, It's for my mother. I have no girl. <laughs> and then I believe he did say, Well, your mother's a girl. It's good for mothers. <laughs> more, more beads for co workers. Uh, ooh, kind of like these. But one uh, meaning to offer it at a monastery. What is it? And then promptly forgot. Um, don't know what they're called. 
the silk fibers. Oh, a kata. Kata, kata. You can buy these outside the monastery. Um, big long katas. You can drip around your neck or offer to the uh, priests, which was very nice. The lamas. The lamas. Excuse me. <laughs> wrong wrong re religion there. Some prayer bowls, singing bowls for my brothers. I was just playing with the expensive I one I bought. Fun. Can you get that one to sing? At uh, uh, Swan Budnath, just uh, yesterday, I think. Possibly. Had it going for a while. I will admit I bought this from a shop on the street and I don't remember how many rupees I paid for it. Uh, it's not the very high end, high quality, so it doesn't hold the sound as long as uh, some of the real ones do, but they do have a certain charm. It is from Nepal and uh, just a quick gift for my brothers. I wasn't here shopping for uh, expensive large items, just kind of keepsakes, memorabilia, and uh, I think they're beautiful. I love them. And, uh, got a certain charm. I think they'll appreciate it. So, Anyway, it's fun for me. I think Fatika. Fatika. I'm not sure, but that's Miss Nepal. She was just crowned the other day. <laughs> oh, that's right. She's Good on, for her. Uh, yeah, she's on everything. She's on everything. Now. <laughs> I completely forgot about 7th. that. What's that? I think April 7th. Okay. Was, While we were here, I remember, yeah. because they said live on Nepali TV. What else do we have? Oh, 100% pure yak wool. Oh, really? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> Again, street vendor. You bought it as 100%. I'm going to, you know. Yeah, you pay you for, for 100%. Yeah. But it is. Yak wool. I didn't pay much. Anyway, nice little market. Very happy about that. I love watching this footage, but oh. um, of course what I don't have is... One of my favorite purchases the bartering skills that Scott and I developed <laughs> and how we'd act in tandem to get the best deal. Eight dollars. We've alluded to this before. It worked out very face? well. No. The, the North, North Force. Force. North Farce. The North, the North Farce. Face. <laughs> it's basically a knockoff, but, uh, you know, it's nylon, so wind resistant. I'm going to run in it, and uh, it's a good deal. How much was that? I don't remember how many rupees. I bought it. I bought it on one of the first days we were here, 450, something like that. It was under five. 67 to the dollar yeah. at that point. So you tell me. <laughs> I think it's a good deal. Oh, I'm not going to unroll it, but uh, thank you. Tibeta, Tibetan thank you, painting. And uh, it's not old, of course, but uh, we actually went to a, a little workshop today. And uh, I spent a little bit of money on this because I really liked it. It's the Tibetan Wheel of Life, and it, it explains um, something about the reincarnation and where you go in life and uh, developing merit or being a bad person where you go. But uh, very happy with the purchase. The done rolls. It's about that size. It's uh, actually uh, painted on cloth. We watched the Thunkas being painted today, uh, kind of in a line. There were, I think, eight artists, and they each took uh, different portions of the painting but uh, very detailed and very beautiful. And uh, I liked it quite a bit. In Tibet, I was pulled into a little back shop. And again, you know, there are so many tourists here, it's hard to know what's authentic and what you're just being sold. Uh, you know, being told it's authentic or being told that real gold, real gold, and you just gotta know <laughs> it's not. But beautiful painting, probably made in the past year, I would imagine. And uh, anyway, in Tibet, I was taken to the back shop, and uh, the thunkas were really old, very old looking. And I'm not sure if they were manufactured to look that way, but they were dirty, uh, and the edges were kind of ragged. And the guy is telling me, during the Cultural Revolution, when the Chinese came in and destroyed most of the temples um, in some of the family heirlooms, that uh, they saved them. And he's got a bunch of them. A lot of the shops, most of the shops selling antiques, 
a lot of the antiques are false, but a lot of the Funkas are real from monasteries and families, and uh, I refused to buy it. They were beautiful, but that stuff needs to stand to that. Unfortunately, it's going, you know, out on the black market. Um, and I guess if the Chinese had their way, they would destroy it, but maybe not so much now, but back then that would have, so. At least the Chinese leaders. On use tape. And all the gloves. All the medication for three weeks in a different country. Very happy about taking those. <laughs> <laughs> I have one uh, antibiotic left. Uh, gonna take it tonight for sure. Birkenstocks for traveling. They must. Wear those on the airplane, right? Yes. Good. I'll throw my uh, my tennies in the bag. Oh, very. Let's uh, see your bag. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. these are great. <laughs> Again, the guy wanted five fifty. I talked him down to four, four fifty. I don't remember. Nepali rupees. I think the exchange rate is sixty six, but none of the shop owners will give you <laughs> less than sixty eight because. I want to make two more rupees. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Sixty-six is black market. Black market. Real exchange rate, sixty-eight. So, uh, you know, when you're paying rupees, you pay more. North Face bag for all of my good stuff. Two duffel bags for the ride home. One duffel bag for the ride here. Well, that's one of the cool things you can get. All this, all this North Farce uh, stuff. Kind of a nice way to end the trip. <laughs> Um, hopefully tomorrow the skies will be clear. Uh, Nepal has been under the under this haze for the past couple of weeks. Uh, they've really needed rain here. Um, we had a nice little uh, lunch with Babu Karma and a friend of his. And we went over to a cafe and had apple pie <laughs> a la mode. It was pretty good, but uh, it's. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's time to get going, it's time to go home. We've got one more night here, and then we are going to leave tomorrow for the airport around 11.30 in the morning and fly to Bangkok. And then uh, that'll be a short flight, just a couple of hours, two and a half hours, and then we will head out to uh, a hotel there because we have a 15-hour layover. And from there we go uh, to Hong Kong, which is, a, I think, like three or four hours. And then we have a 14, 12 to 14 hour flight to LA. And then from LA, I think it's only like two and a half, three hours to Denver, where Heidi will be there to pick me up and Scott. So looking forward to that. Um, it's it's kind of nice here right now also, because you can, you can kind of see Swayampu, the monkey temple all lit up in all its glory up on the hill. Here, I'll zoom into that. Off in the distance there, that's Swayampu. Man, I'm doing a terrible job of photography right now. Oh well. I think I've done some of my best work on this trip. But it can't all be good, and this is the raw footage as always. So this is the stuff you didn't have to see. This is usually just the stuff you show your family. Um, but it's been a really good trip. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's been a success. And, um, you know, it's really good to have come back <clears throat> and it's going to be good to go home. So I don't know when my next uh, trip out here will be. Hopefully it'll be in a few years and maybe I could bring family along. You know, that's been a real theme of this trip is John struggling to uh, figure out uh, all of the different emotions that go along with trying to start a family. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it and this trip has really gotten me in touch with the parts of me that I was really hoping to. Um, different spiritual parts of myself, different emotional parts, and uh, it's good. And it's been good to uh, spend some time with Scott, one of my oldest friends, and he is actually going to be moving about a month or so, maybe after he gets back to Colorado. He has been offered a job at Yosemite National Park in the North uh, Tuolumne Meadows District and uh, he's accepted it. He's been offered it, he's accepted it. It was something he's been hoping for for about three months 
and it finally came through so we're happy for him and um, but you know him living in California means that uh, we won't see each other very often but uh, it's good <clears throat> it's good that we had this 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 trip it was quite an adventure and uh, who knows what's coming around the bend so we'll only time will tell so we'll see uh, We'll see what comes of that. But I'm going to finish enjoying this rainy evening. And then we're going to go get some dinner. Maybe back at the Rum Doodle. We had their lunch, uh, dinner there last night. Uh, it's close walking distance, so if it's still raining, we can go there. Otherwise, we're going to try to go to Fire and Ice, which is a nice uh, sort of place that all the climbers go at least once um, on these trips to Everest. So uh, probably see you in the morning. Nope. <laughs> we won't see you in the morning. That's it. Um, you know, I, a couple things here. First of all, Scott, I, I just have to say again, it was, it was just one of the, one of the coolest things in the world to go on this trip with you. I mean, I just remember being 19 and living in, in the very first house I'd ever, you know, rented. It wasn't a dorm room and, or wasn't my parents' house. And uh, I think Scott and I, Scott and I were both uh, renting that house and, you know, we were kind of just, I think, flipping through it. I want to say we were flipping through a catalog about, like, studying abroad and they had Nepal as one of the places you could go and we just kind of got to thinking how cool it would be to go on an Everest base camp trek. And, you know, all these all these years later to actually have done it. Um, and just to still be friends, to still be, you know, very close friends and and you know we were just kids back then but now you know adults both established in our careers and in our lives and everything it just was it just was really a really wonderful experience and i just want to thank you for saying yes when i uh asked if you'd be game for going <laughs> well john i want to thank you for the opportunity of uh having this adventure man you've been my dearest friend all along so what a way to uh, <laughs> experience, you know, travel together um, through friendship. So just an amazing thing. So it's kind of bittersweet. I got to set the rest of Everest aside now and, and become a subscriber again. But uh, I wish you the best of luck in this endeavor um, in the future. And, you know, I'll be right there alongside you. Anything you need. Um, the, one of the things is, you know, we, we mentioned this was your very first time leaving the continent. And uh, it sounds to me like the, the travel bug has bitten you hard. Now, where are you hoping to go next? <laughs> well, I've got two trips planned. I'm going to spend some time close to home in uh, the Baja, um, south peninsula of Mexico. Um, but trying to set aside four weeks to go to Thailand, um, Laos, Cambodia. Um, probably going to do it alone. I'm <laughs> still looking for a travel partner as uh, you have plans. But uh, yeah, the travel bug has bitten me hard and uh, it's kind of become this uh, drive at this point, <laughs> this need to, to get out and, and, and see the, the world. One of the one of the other things I, I like about this whole trek and, and the conclusion here is that, you know, I, I've said it again and again, this is a trek that anyone could do. You know, we, we, we talk and we, we look at all these exotic images and that makes it look like this part of the world is not just half a world away, but several worlds away. And it really isn't. It's something you really can do. You can accomplish it. You can, uh, it will not break the bank. Uh, you know, it just would take some time to save up. And it's something you can really do. Uh, Everest and, and these parts of the world, Tibet and Nepal, are not inaccessible. They are places you can go. Um, you don't have to think, oh, I can never, I never have the opportunity to do that. And that's just, it's just not true. You know, the only real roadblock would be one that you would set for yourself. Neither Scott nor I are independently wealthy. <laughs> uh, it just took some time, took some, you know, fortunate uh, coincidences with me getting some, some extra freelance work and everything to help pay for this trip and uh, all of your generous uh, financial support to cover the satellite minutes uh, on the satellite phone and everything, but really is something that can be done. So I really encourage anyone who's interested to really think about really taking a trip out there. And uh, just personally, the other thing I really like to smile about when I think about this trip is, and, and being away from home for three weeks, you know, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. And, you know, this was 
you saw me really struggling with being separated from my wife and whatnot, but uh, our son Sam owes his existence to the strip. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, the, the night uh, that we returned back to Colorado, um, well, yep. That's where uh, his journey began. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> thinking about crying and loss, uh, missing Heidi so much, and, you know, her not being pregnant and still suffering from the, the miscarriage we experienced. And now, now I just got this beautiful eight month old. It's just makes me smile from ear to ear. And today, for the first time, he's wearing a little toddler or no, little shirt embroidered by my embroider out in Kathmandu, who makes all of the t shirts. He sent that out as a gift, and Sam is finally big enough to wear it. So, very excited about that. So, all right, enough. Scott, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful journey. I look forward to many more in the future. And everyone, remember to stay subscribed. There's a lot of content coming your way, many more journeys coming your way. So the rest of Everest will continue, continue to show you uh, different aspects of these cultures and these, these faraway places. And uh, thanks for your support. Thanks for your financial support. And uh, thanks for all of the wonderful emails. And keep them coming. Let me know what you thought about this series. I really, really appreciate your input. So thanks so much, one, And we will see you next time. Bye. The rest of Everest is downloaded all over the world every week. If you enjoy watching and would like to show your support, then take a look at my website. Aside from having lots of additional blog entries from the expedition updated every week, there's this little donation button on every page. Now, many of you have pressed that button and your generous contributions are helping to cover my hosting fees. If you haven't donated but would like to, then just contribute any amount. In return, I'll give you access to the video and audio dispatches I sent out while we were actually at Everest. It's pretty interesting stuff. Contribute $25 or more, and I'll even throw in an iPod-compatible version of the film Everest The Other Side. That's the project the entire podcast here is based on. As always, our announcer is Marlon May, and our music is provided by Wendy Wu. Check her out at wendywu.com. Thank you for watching The Rest of Everest. For more information on the expedition, please visit therestofeverest.com.